you know, the church are making mistakes, they're getting judged, some of them are getting weak and ill, and some of them are dying because of some kind of judgment. Paul doesn't seem to be happy. What, what is going on here? Because Paul starts this, very, this, this passage, and it's very straightforward. I don't know if you've ever had a, a bad review at work. But this is, this is Paul's review of the church in Corinth when it comes to their Sunday meetings. In the following, previously said, you're doing okay in these matters, let me just instruct you. But in verse 17, in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. It's essentially saying, guys, it would be better if you stayed at home than what you are doing when you get together in church. So the question we have to ask is like, what was going on in this church that was such a problem and particularly symbolized around the table, the breaking of bread and the drinking of wine together? So let me just set the scene for us and then we're going to learn some things as we gather around Jesus and gather around the table. This is what's going on. I mean, like in any city like London, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I think cities are amazing. You just get all sorts of cultures clashed together into one, right? On one side of the road, you can have 10 million pound houses. And then literally on the other side of the road, you can have council houses. And they're just coexisting together. You have every ethnicity under the sun just kind of living together in one place. You have rich, poor, working class, middle class, upper class, everything in between. And it's the same in Corinth. And so they had people in the church who were wealthy and they had people in the church who were very poor. And what seems to be happening is that they didn't have any church buildings. I mean, we don't have a church building, but they didn't have church buildings. So what they would do is they would essentially use those who had the biggest homes, normally the wealthier people in the church. They would open their home on a Sunday for the church gathering. And their Sunday was more like our Monday. So you've got to think they were doing church around their Monday working patterns. And so what would happen is the laborers, those who were poorer, would often be working longer hours and those who are wealthier would be working less hours. They would be coming to their homes, gathering together with their probably friends already, the same social class, same economic class, gathering around, eating nice food, drinking nice wine, leisurely lunch, going into the afternoon, eating too much, getting drunk. I mean, that is not a good start to church, right? Getting drunk before you've even started singing. And so these wealthy people were gathering beforehand. And then those who were laboring through the day, who were coming later, were coming late to this, what had already been going maybe for a couple of hours to this social gathering. And they didn't have the kind of food or the wine that the wealthier people of the church had. And even archeologists now think that what was happening is that probably the homes only fit like 10 to 15 people in the main like living room area so that those who were coming late would go and have their dinner their food in the courtyard so there probably was even a physical divide between some of the wealthier ones and those who didn't have and we're told in this passage that Paul says those who had money and food and nice wine weren't even bothering to share it with those who didn't have you can see what kind of mess this was like so many issues arising, divisions. So that Paul can even say that those who had were humiliating. He says, what? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. I mean, this is, if you were like in the church and you knew he was talking about you, this is like a gulp moment right this was on the nose stuff and so what paul does is he teaches what is actually happening when we gather around the bread and the wine when we gather around jesus and i want to just pull out five things if, if i was in a more sensible mood i probably would only pull out two or three but i just couldn't drop the other points so <laughs> i'm going to try and be quick i promise um but Paul, Paul draws out five things here. He draws out a remembering that we have to do, a feasting that we do, a proclaiming, a discerning, and an anticipating that we do when we gather around the table. And for us in the West now, this can often feel like a, 
an add-on, like an extra thing we do, like a cherry on top every now and again. But in the New Testament times, it's interesting, they would basically describe going to church as breaking bread. So if you pass someone in the street, say, where are you going this morning? So I'm going to church. In the New Testament time, they probably would have said, I'm going to go break bread with my brothers and sisters. It became this kind of coin word for going to church because this actually became central to the act of worship as believers. This wasn't something on the side. This was something of the main event. It feels difficult to think of it when it's been reduced to this. You think of meals and food and sitting around tables and now we have this. But there is deep symbolism in what's going on as we gather around this table. And it's this symbolism that I wanna speak into, if that's all right. So five things. The first thing is this. When we gather around the Lord's table as a church, we are remembering Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. This is what he says in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. He's saying, remember church, this is what we're supposed to be doing. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, he says. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of of me when we take this bread and we drink this wine we are remembering but we are remembering through reenacting every christmas right we normally get the children and one or two willing adults to participate in a nativity right we reenact we remember the birth of jesus through reenacting those early moments and jesus christ asks us to remember him through reenacting the meal that he had the night before he was betrayed to literally retake that meal to replay that meal to reenact that meal so that we might remember christ and the amazing thing is that as a church when we do that we actually find ourselves deep in ancient history because jesus himself was not starting a brand new meal on that thursday night he himself was taking the passover meal that had been taken for centuries upon centuries upon centuries he himself was remembering the salvation of God. So if you've been in church for a while, you will know the moment where God's people are in captivity in Egypt and they've been crying out to the Lord for salvation, asking for salvation from this moment of slavery. And God comes and he answers through this man, Moses, and deliverance comes, nine plagues, and yet Pharaoh hardens his heart. And so he says that there will be one last plague and the angel of death is gonna sweep across the land. But to God's people, a promise is given, salvation is provided. And he tells every family that to take a sacrificial lamb and to sacrifice this lamb and to take the blood of the lamb and to place it over the doorpost of your home. And as a family, you are to remain in your home under the blood of the lamb so that when the angel of death passes across the land and the firstborn of every family is killed in that night, if you trust in the Lord and rest in his work, the angel of death will pass you by. It's literally the passing over of judgment. And so God's people remembered the passing over of judgment year after year after year, this once a year meal. And Jesus on this Thursday night was remembering the moment where God's judgment passed his people by, except he does something amazing on this moment. He doesn't remember in this moment, he says, let us remember that this day judgment passes us by. What does he do? He takes the bread and he says, do this in remembrance of me and he breaks bread in remembrance of himself because judgment wasn't going to pass that upper room that night jesus himself was not going to pass the judgment onto a sacrificial lamb he himself was going to get up and walk out into the darkness to receive judgment upon himself he was going to be the one who would receive our sin on himself he would take judgment on himself so that we could go free the angel of death stopped over that room and came to christ and he willingly went to the cross and had his own body broken so that you and i could walk free amen, amen. 
imagine the first disciples looking at Jesus thinking in remembrance of you what do you mean remembrance of you that didn't make sense to them at the time like judgment is passing us by right and now he's symbolically breaking his body in front of them and says this is going to be me now and so when we gather around this table we are remembering that here in Christ Jesus is our salvation here judgment was taken for us on our behalf here our sins have been dealt with here we can receive eternal life here the wrath of God has been spent so that we don't have to live under it anymore here is everything we need where in Christ Jesus we remember him and we need this. this this table is like an anchor for our lives it's an anchor for us as a church because we are so prone to wandering off in our own hearts to our own good deeds and our own works i mean we are constantly told to be doing things right everywhere you turn like your boss is like giving you goals and achievements and kpis and you know your spouse your no one look at me you know <laughs> friends parents expectations if you've got older kids asking you for stuff younger kids are there's just so many things even if there's nothing to do your heart generates more things that you think you want to be doing and we lay our own condemnation on ourselves don't we because we don't feel like we're doing well enough or whatever life is filled with this sense that we are not quite achieving or doing enough and yet when we come to this table we are reminded that jesus christ has done everything that we need there is nothing else to be done amen? amen the most important thing has been sorted we have peace with god so we're reminded to come to this table and rest to receive it like we actually have salvation so the first thing we do is we remember the second thing we do is feast god made us physical for a reason there are some heavenly beings who are not physical like us but he chose to encase us in this physical, touchable, eatable, smellable, tasteable world. He chose to create bread. He chose to make us so that we could get hungry. We could have lived as spirit beings like some in the heavenly realms do. But he has chosen us to have bodies for a very specific reason. So that when we are hungry our souls could have an object lesson and jesus could say to us i am the bread of life and whoever eats of me shall never hunger again and so that we could eat don't worry you're not going to have to eat this bread <laughs> you're probably looking at me like oh let me avoid the bread that daniel's been manhandling the whole sermon <laughs> I'll keep it over here now okay <laughs> so you know which has been but he made bread so that our souls could learn through our bodies that as we eat this bread our bodies are satisfied and energized and strengthened and as our souls come to Jesus we are energized and satisfied and strengthened when we eat the bread it will eventually become one with us through digestion and biological means that i'm not sure exactly how it works but at some point the food that we eat right becomes indissolvable from us like there are parts of lasagna that are i guess engaged in other parts of your cells that have made up your physical being right now the food and you become utterly indissolvable and in the same way that when we take in this bread and we come to christ by faith we're told that he abides in us and we abide in him that we are united in christ in such a way that we are utterly inseparable from him so that no sin can separate us from his love nothing so that we are united right now we're told seated in the heavenly realms at the right hand of god the father and whether you've had a good week or whether you've had a bad week you are united with christ as much as that bread is part of your body now you cannot be separated from christ he is yours 
and you are his amen this is what paul says in the chapter early has his little heads up on communion and he says the cup of blessing that we bless talking about communion when they gather is it not a participation the word there is koinonian if you've been in church for a while you know it's that fellowship word it's that togetherness word if you are taking of christ you have fellowship with him you are bound up with him and he says the bread that we break is it not participation fellowship in the body of christ so we're giving this profound object lesson for our souls that we are with him so we come to feast on christ and so i want to encourage you when we gather to break bread together don't feel i mean i don't know if it's a very british trait because we're not very forward we're not very nigerian i've learned nigerians are very like they'll just go for it brits we like to be come across polite if we even if we're not polite in our hearts we like to come across polite you know so we just take a little bit you think oh that's i'm a modest kind of person so i'll take a modest kind of amount it feels like a very humble thing to do right i don't want to take too much that's presumptuous of me but how do we come to the table we come as sinners in need of abundant grace right Amen. so why not come and take plenty feast take a whole handful give some to those around you <laughs> I would have eaten it, but Finney's finished it, so thanks, Finney. <laughs> don't, don't come thinking, I just want a little bit of Christ. I want all of Christ. So I'm going to eat and I'm going to drink and I'm going to feast on him. Amen. So we feast. The third thing we do is that we proclaim. Paul tells us here in verse 26 for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim you preach you tell the Lord's death until he comes this is amazing and this overlaps with the other points but it's, it's really important we're actually and it seems to be the, the proclamation here sorry the proclamation here is not so much what we're doing with our words that's important because Paul says to, to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 that things are sanctified by the word of God and through prayer. So that we need to speak the word of God and speak words of prayer over this moment, sanctify this moment. So it's not just bread and it's not just wine. But the actual act of what we're doing is a proclamation. It's preaching to us so that the way that we do this is really important we're preaching to ourselves so that when we're taking this bread we're telling our weary souls that there is strength to be had in jesus we're telling our restless souls that are always thinking we must be doing more to find the pleasure of god we're telling our souls no 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 everything's been done take a rest my sin has been thrown as far as the east is from the west i'm going to sit down and enjoy this meal we proclaim it to ourselves and we also proclaim it to each other as brothers and sisters so this is something we do with with one another that we take it and the way that we take it i want to suggest that we take it with joy and thanksgiving is a proclamation to our brothers and sisters in the church so that when we see hannah and matt taking it with thanksgiving it preaches to us so let me encourage you this is not just for you in the West, we tend to think, ah, me, me and Jesus, great. I get blessings from Jesus. I happen to be in a room with other people, a bit inconvenient, but okay, you know, but it's me and Jesus. Paul says, no, this is a proclamation. What you are doing has implications for those around you. So why not break this bread and share this wine with those around you and speak words to one another? Why not be a preacher today and just say something of what you're grateful to God for? It might feel super awkward if you've never done it before. The Anglicans are really good at this. This is the body of Christ broken for you. That's preaching. That's proclaiming. That's saying truth to another. We can learn from that. Speak words of life and encouragement. I remember once breaking bread in Victoria's church and we were married at that point and it was actually her mum and dad who were part of the servers, a big Anglican church. And Toria's mum shared with me just these words, said, this is the, um, 
I think it was around the wine. I, can't, I think it was around the wine. This is the blood of Christ, the new covenant. Here is eternal life. And she said those. And I looked at this silver goblet, because the Anglicans do it properly, you know, like <laughs> full goblets. And uh, I just looked into this cup for eternal life. And I drank that. And the, the Lord met me i was preached to in that moment by my mother-in-law eternal life and it still stuck with me as i drink this i am taking in the eternal life of jesus christ so speak words it might just be this is the body of christ broken for you it might be something that you're grateful for it might be something you're grateful for the other person but speak some words of blessing and proclamation over this and this is also a proclamation as we take this to those of you who aren't christians you may be here, you might be invited by a friend, you're not a Christian, you're not sure about Jesus. Here is a moment where you can see what Christ has done for the redeemed. And the invitation is to you to come and receive the forgiveness that we have. Amen. So we proclaim. So it matters how we take it. Sometimes it might be a more sober moment. Sometimes it's a more thankful moment. But it's not just you and Jesus, it's us and Jesus. Amen. Third point. I'm going quick enough, right? The fourth thing, and this is where it gets interesting. This is the gear change moment. We are discerning the body. What's going on here? Paul says five times in this passage, he says, when you come together, you're gathering. When you come together, when you come together, when you come together, when you come together. And this is a practical thing of like literally just like when you gather at 11 o'clock and the coin street, it's that kind of thing. But it's also speaking of this symbolic relational and spiritual oneness, this coming together as one. Because Sundays are not just like an incidental on the side blessing. Hey, if you can get to church on a Sunday, that would be really good for you. These moments when we gather are the symbolic moment in the week when we remember that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. That's why we gather on a Sunday morning and we are a body and are unified as one. So what happens in our gathering is of vital importance. We are symbolizing the invisible that is in the week. We are making visible the kingdom of God, which is why our presence is required. Because we are together making visible this new community in Christ so that London can see what it is like to be the redeemed church of God. And we gather as one. And that, that oneness isn't like it's a nice thing to have because community is a bit of a buzzword at the moment and we all like to do community and so we've got another angle on community. Our oneness is founded on something much more than just geographical or personal likes or a hobby or that we all happen to like one man. Our oneness is based on the fact that we all got into this based on the work, the death, the life, the resurrection of that one man, Jesus Christ. We're all one because none of us got here on our own merit. I don't take of the table because I did well this last week and I feel like I'm okay with Jesus so I can take it. I, I didn't, I, I'm not here taking it because I'm a pastor or I was the one preaching today. You, you're not coming to the table because there's anything in your life to commend you. You come to the table because Christ let you come. I'm here because Christ let me. What I bring to this table is sin, unrighteousness, selfishness, a wayward heart. It's constantly looking at other things in the world. And yet Jesus says, will you come and find grace in me? you here because of Christ and he let you in and that's the only reason we're here and that's our oneness why are you here because Christ let you in why am I here because Christ let me in <laughs> he died for my sins and so I, I'm in no place to break this unity because I, I, I have no ground on which to stand on and I have received grace upon grace forgiveness upon forgiveness and so if someone's hurt me or I feel hurt, I have no ground on which to hold on to any grudge or annoyance 
because I've, I've received everything from Jesus Christ. And so my call as I come to this table is to maintain the unity that God has given us as a church. And I'm not to live out of fellowship with anyone. And so when we gather around this symbol of oneness, the bread and the wine, the body of Christ, we as a church are to be one. Which means that there is to be no disunity, either in physical relationships or even in our hearts. And this is where it gets tricky because Paul says this is the problem with them. They were a church who literally looked divided. If you went to that church, you were like, well, it looks like there's two churches. There's a church for those who don't have much money and there's a church for those who have lots of money. Like, it's two. are there two Christs? Paul says, no, how you do this together is of vital importance. And they needed to extend grace and forgiveness to one another as they come together. And this is why Paul goes on to talk about these verses. So let me just walk through these for a second. It's important. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, let me just say, some people take this to mean that you need to have had like a sinless week if you want to take of this bread and wine. Like if you feel like oh, I've sinned this week again, I feel guilty, maybe I shouldn't partake of this. This is not what Paul is talking about. He's not asking for chronic introspection because if you are chronically introspected about your own sin, you will never feel worthy. What is the one thing that qualifies to actually come to the table? You're a sinner and you have Jesus. So if you are guilty this week, this is the place to come. What he is talking about here is the relational aspect between us as a church and those that we are in relationship with. So he says, let a person examine himself or herself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So there's a moment of reflection for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drink judgment on himself. And now discerning the body means here, I think us, not the body of Christ, because the context is a church that is looking divided. So it's discerning, seeing the fact that we are one and sensing, am I out of relationship? Am I humiliating anyone else in the church? Have I hurt anyone? Am I hurt? Am I holding grudges against anyone? Am I harboring bitterness against anyone else in my heart? Are there things that are breaking the unity of this church, even in my heart? And I would suggest that's the more important thing to do. I mean, I can speak for British people being British, or maybe English, I'll narrow it down. But you know, English people, we, we have an amazing ability to look polite and Christian on the outside and hold on to the best of grudges and bitterness on the inside. I don't know, you can speak to your own ethnicity and whatever and background and culture, but I think we can do that, right? Anyone with me? You've all gone super silent. You're making me feel very lonely up here. We can do that. That is actually breaking the unity that Christ has suffered for us in this bread and in this wine. And so what do we do? We discern the body, we look around, and we come to this table and there might be a moment before you break the bread where you want to say sorry to somebody. I feel like I've wronged you. They might feel like you've wronged them or they might not feel like you've wronged them. But you just feel like, I, I want to ask for your forgiveness. You make things right. It may not be appropriate for you to confess some sins. It's not appropriate to confess every sin to everybody you sin against. It might be for you and the Lord to say, Lord, I'm sorry, I need grace. I need your forgiveness to permeate my soul so that I might pass on forgiveness. And where Paul talks about judgment falling on us is for those, I think, who are unwilling to be reconciled to a brother or a sister, who are unwilling to show forgiveness, who are unwilling to do what's needed to make every effort and still come, and just take it like everything's okay. This is, this is what he says later. He says, that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. Ouch. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined 
so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Let me just open up one brief caveat and then close it very briefly. It does seem to be that sometimes Christians get sick or even die because God in his kindness does not want them to be condemned eternally with the world. Notice, this is not just God losing his rag with a Christian saying, right, that's it, you're out of the kingdom. He's saying so that they may not be condemned along with the world. So some people die, it seems, because God does that because they are leading their own lives into a path of condemnation. Do you understand what I'm saying? It is possible to take this in a way that if we're not willing to pass on forgiveness, we drink and eat judgment upon ourselves. Does it seem to happen every time? No, but there is a, a reality there that we need to deal with. It's not just, hey, it's communion. Nice, blessings. There's an examination. There's a discerning of the church. It might be for those who are outside of the church and you say, I am unwilling to forgive that person. Sometimes people say that, don't they? I will never forgive you. I will never be back in relationship with you. An examination needs to happen. You may not feel like you've got the strength to forgive or to reconcile. In which case, you come to the table and say, Lord, I do not feel I've got the strength to reconcile, but I want to. So please, as I take of this strength, would you provide strength into my soul that I might reconcile with that person? Amen. And the last thing we do is that we anticipate the coming of Christ. Because he says here in verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. When? Until he comes so this table is like a trailer like an eatable trailer that we take for the real deal when jesus christ will one day come again and we're told that the redeemed of god will sit down with the son of god around the wedding feast and we will banquet with jesus with the richest of foods and the richest of wines and we will celebrate like never before and this is just a moment of reminding us that Jesus is coming back. However dark things get, the light of the world is coming back. However lost we feel, the great shepherd of his sheep is coming back to find us. However guilty we feel in our sin, the saviour of the world is coming back to redeem us fully from every single sin. Hallelujah. There is hope at this table, which is just good news. Tori was saying yesterday, you know, just since then, I just felt like it was just spot on that there is, there is this sense of like a, a lack of hope at the moment in London. I don't know if you feel that. Tori articulated it as like a sadness, just like a, a quiet sadness everywhere you go, like a, a lack of energy or something, a lack of motivation for because there is, so, there is so much uncertainty and we've been battered by so many things over the last three, four, five years. And we seem to continually be our own worst enemy across the board, nation to nation, individual to individual. And we seem to be trying to climb to a better place and, we, and it feels like here is hope. Jesus Christ is coming back, hallelujah, and everything is going to be made right. So we eat this with anticipatory joy. Amen. Amen. So we're going to eat.